you have your Bibles, would you turn please to the book of James? James chapter 4, and uh, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 10. And uh, we'll spend a little time talking about the benefits of what I want to talk about. And then we'll talk about how it can be a reality in our own life. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. You know, when we come to the start of a new year, as we are today, the very first day of the new year, we can't help but think in our mind about the topic of uh, New Year's resolutions. What did we just sing about? Being resolved to do something. New Year's resolutions. Uh, for many years, it's been quite common that people, when they get to this time of year, they try to make resolutions, and really what they are are uh, goals, uh, their desires, their plans at least, to try and better ourselves in many cases, uh, to try to have a better existence, maybe a more productive life, maybe a more fruitful life, uh, maybe even a more pleasurable life than you had the year before. Sometimes those things will uh, include resolutions like uh, diet and exercise. That's the one you hear probably the most of when you come to a new year. Don't talk about that, right? <clears throat> trying to read more, study more, you know, trying to give up a bad habit, trying to get more organized, trying to spend more time with family and friends, all those types of things that people resolve to do. And let's admit it, there's a lot of good things in that. There's a lot of good things to resolve, to uh, be more dedicated to, to be more diligent in. Because when we come to a new year, we kind of see what we think of in this new year as a uh, blank paper, you might say. A, a blank slate in which there's a lot of days coming up that we don't know how it's going to go. And we have a lot of choice as to how we allow the Lord to direct our life. He will direct us if we will let him. But we have to make that choice. So can I tell you, in light of all that, I believe the best New Year's resolution we could make in our life, this is the best one I know of you can have, would be to draw nearer to God Amen. in 2023. That's the best thing I know of to resolve to do. What did we just sing about? That song goes right along. I requested it that we would sing that. It goes right along with it. What did it say? I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Yes. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. So I will hasten to him. What does that sound like? Drawing nearer. Drawing nigh to God. One of the scriptures we're about to read says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. I will hasten to him. Hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest. I will come to thee. In other words, here's what I'm going to talk about this morning. I hope that your resolution this year will be to pull up a little closer. To pull up a little closer. Because when you go and you go and sit down at the table, what do you do? You sit down in the chair, you get yourself situated, and then you, you scoot up to the table. You pull up a little closer. Because see, you know that whatever bread I'm about to break, whatever meal I'm about to eat, I can't enjoy that meal if the table's way up there and I'm way back here. If I'm going to enjoy the experience that this meal's about to bring me, I'm going to have to pull up a little closer. Yeah. Pull up a little closer is the title of the message. We need to draw nigh to God, and he's promised he'll draw nigh to us. If you found James chapter 4, would you read with me? Would you stand, actually, as we read God's word, if you're able? And starting at verse number 1 says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? In other words, why is there contention in your life? In other words, those lusts, those ungodly desires that get mixed up in our motivations in our life, that's the source of that contention in our lives when that comes. You lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war. What does that sound like? Somebody that's trying to make it happen all on their own. They're fighting and warring. 
They're designing, you know, there are all these things going on in their mind. They're trying to make it happen on their own. And then look what he says. Yet ye have not because ye ask not. Right. You're trying to do it all on your own, but God says, have you asked me? Mm -hmm. Have you consulted me about what's going on? Then he says in verse 3, ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss. And we'll talk about that a little more. That ye may consume it upon your lust. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Yeah. Whosoever therefore will be, now this is a big statement, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world, wait a minute, is the enemy of God. Oh my. my goodness, the enemy of God. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Yes. Here's some great verses. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Yes. And then here's the phrase we want to focus on, especially today. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. You say, wait a minute. I thought there was joy in serving Jesus. I thought he sent a happiness and a peace into your soul that the world, you can't even compare to what the world could give you. He does. But this is a picture, I believe, of somebody that realizes their heart is not right with the Lord. They've realized their hands aren't clean before him. They've realized they've been walking in a double-minded state, as it talks about here, rather than being single-minded in your devotion to the Lord. And he says, when you come to me, don't come here with a little laugh on your voice. Come with a sorrow in your heart and realize how you've broken the heart of God and straying away from him. But then notice what he'll do when you humble yourselves in that way. Last verse, verse 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. I'll give you that joy back if you just humble yourself, pull up a little closer, get right with me if you're not, and then I'll lift you up, he says. Lord, I pray you'd bless the reading of your word. I pray you would speak to us plainly and clearly and powerfully. Pray that you would anoint my words, help me to say just what you'd have me to, nothing more, nothing less. Please help us to hear from you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can be seated. We're going to be coming back to James 4 before the end of the message, but I want to start by giving you what I would call some benefits of living close to the Lord. Some benefits, I'm just going to mention, they're just short little statements, some benefits of living close to the Lord, and then we'll talk about how that can be a reality in our life. And one thing we always need to take note when we think about the Lord's blessings is this. We shouldn't serve the Lord just for the blessings. Would you agree? We shouldn't serve him just for the blessings. We serve him because of who he is. We serve him because we want to please him. But my goodness, what a truckload of blessings he does have that he wants to give us when we serve him. So here's just a few. Number one benefit I would say is when you live close to the Lord, he wants to give you, number one, the secrets of the kingdom. The secrets of the kingdom. In other words, when you live your life close to the Lord, I mean this. You open your life to the Lord making known to you those secrets of the kingdom. In other words, those truths of God that not just everybody understands. That not just everybody understands. God reveals himself in a greater way to you as you begin to get closer to him. He begins to reveal himself more. Psalm 25 and 14 says it like this. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will shew them his covenant. And when we talk about fearing the Lord, I like to think of a definition that I heard one time that I think is just about the best definition I've ever heard on what it means to fear the Lord. I've talked about this in Sunday school. To fear the Lord is simply to take him seriously. That's what it means to fear the Lord. We take him seriously. We reverence him, we respect him, and we take him seriously. 
And uh, if we're doing what we need to do, we don't have to be fearful in an afraid way, in a frightened way of the Lord. Just like if you're not doing anything wrong out on the road, you don't have to be afraid of the police. You don't have to be afraid of our law enforcement. But if you are doing something wrong, and you see those blue lights light up behind you, there's going to be a little fear in your heart. But what are we doing? We're taking them serious. We're taking them serious. That's what it means with our relationship with the Lord. We fear Him. We take Him seriously. And if we take Him seriously, we're going to be desiring that closer walk with the Lord. Just a closer walk with Thee. We sang that last night. Granted, Jesus, tis my plea. And when we're living like that, pulling up a little closer to the table, he says, the secret of the Lord is with you. The secret of the Lord. And uh, you begin to understand things many times about the Lord that you didn't know before as you draw closer to him. As you read the scriptures more, he'll begin to reveal things to you that you didn't understand before. As you begin to keep reading, just keep reading, keep seeking him, keep praying him, he'll begin to open up things in your mind, in your heart, that you didn't know before. Draw nigh to God, he'll draw nigh to you because he says he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And uh, for some, this secret of the Lord, these secrets of the kingdom, for some that have the gift of prophecy, you could say it would be that, that the Lord is giving them words of foreknowledge into the future. But for the general Christian population, I believe you could say this, the secrets of the kingdom are primarily, I would say this, a greater understanding of the kingdom of God, how it works, and what our place is in it. Amen. The secrets of the kingdom, what it's about, how it works, and what our place is in it. And you know, a really good example of this is how Jesus related to his disciples, his followers. We know that Jesus seemed to have different uh, concentric circles, you might say, of how he related to the people around him. We know he had many people that knew about him, but they didn't know him. They knew about him. There was that broad group out there, but he wasn't in relationship with those people. They weren't in relationship with him. You come in a little closer, and he had a lot of followers, didn't he? People would just flock. I mean, they, they would see him, they would hear him, and they would even perhaps follow after some of his teachings. But they were still kind of distant. They weren't up close. They weren't pulling up a little closer. But then he had 12, didn't he? Those 12 disciples. They were ones that had made the choice to pull up a little closer. He says, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. So they pulled up a little closer, those 12. And here's what he said to the 12. He said, unto you it is given, this is in Luke 8, 10, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not see understand. In other words, those out there that are just kind of distant, I don't speak to them as plainly as I speak to the ones that have pulled up a little closer. He says, those out there I speak in parables because I'm trying to draw them in because they can't understand exactly what I'm saying unless they pull in, unless they try to understand what I'm saying. But he says to you that have pulled in, you, you, you 12, I just tell you things outright. I, I just speak plainly and clearly. To you it is known to have the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But you see, he had an even closer group than the 12, didn't he? Right. Within the 12, he had an inner circle of three. Peter, James, and John. It was uh, that group of three, Peter, James, and John, that we see uh, they basically went up a little further with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. The, the 12, or the rest of the group was back here, not Judas, but the rest of the group was back here. But Peter, James, and John went on up a little further. It's Peter, James, and John that we see they were uh, allowed to go up to the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, Jesus had them up there to give them a revelation of himself, proving uh, who he really was in a very strong way a very powerful way. They basically saw his glory on that mountain. They saw who he really was. But they were in that inner circle. So there's a great benefit to 
pulling up a little closer. He gives us the secrets of the kingdom as he knows we need to know them. Now, it's not that we'll ever know it all. We're not God. We won't know it all. But as we get closer, he helps us to understand things more and more that we didn't know before. So that's one benefit I would say is the secrets of the kingdom. Secondly, as you live closer to the Lord, number two, you can better hear his voice. You can better hear his voice. And that goes right along with knowing those secrets of the kingdom. Because uh, you think about what it says. I got a verse here in John 10 and 27. Uh, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them and they follow me. Now the voice is not always going to be an audible voice, obviously. Now he could. He could speak audibly to us if he wanted to. Sometimes he does that through his servants, doesn't he? He may speak to us through somebody else audibly even. But many times the speaking of the Lord, the voice of the Lord, will be that spiritual impression in our heart, won't it? Spiritual impression in our heart. Maybe he's speaking to us through the word. Maybe he's speaking to us through a sermon or a lesson or something that you read perhaps that's in spiritual in nature. He can speak to us and he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. But you know, you thinking of that analogy and the sheep and the shepherd, it's going to be hard for that sheep to hear the voice of the shepherd if he's three or four or five mountains away and the shepherd's way over there. It's going to be hard for him to hear the voice of the shepherd. Uh, now, here's the point, or here's the deal. All we like sheep have gone astray. I mentioned that. We, we've been over there three, four, five mountains away. And it's not how you start the race. It's how you finish. Amen. It's how you finish. And uh, the thing is, what is your response going to be if you find yourself distant from the voice of the shepherd? Are you going to come back? Or are you going to keep going your own way? Jesus is the good shepherd of our souls. And he wants to speak to us. He wants us to hear his voice. But if we're going to hear him like we need to, we've got to pull up a little closer. We've got to get where we can hear him and get all the distractions of the world away. Here's a third thing I would say. Benefit of living close to the Lord. It's the joy of close fellowship. The joy of close fellowship. And you know, one of the best songs I know of that represents that joy of close fellowship with the Lord uh, is spoken of as your life being lived in a peaceful garden. It says, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And the voice, the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses. And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I'm his own. And the joy, the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. And it, go, it talks about his voice. He speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet. The birds hush their singing. They got to listen. And the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. We was talking last night. I was talking to Sister Gay, and she was talking about she couldn't play her tapes anymore in her uh, tape player, but she still liked to sing the songs. And I was talking about the Lord just puts a song in your heart, doesn't he? He does. The melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me I'm his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. There's a joy in close fellowship with the Lord. You know how much joy you get when you get together with your, maybe a friend, maybe family, and you say, my goodness, we're having such a good time, and uh, you just enjoy yourself. But then you get to the end of that time, and many times there's a bit of sadness in your heart, isn't there? Because the time's over. We've got to go back home, go our own separate ways, and we've had such a good time here. And there's a little bit of sadness in your heart. But did you know that never has to happen with you and the Lord? Right. You can have constant, continual fellowship and communion with the Lord. And you never have to get to that point and say, Boy, I just wish I could feel His presence more. Uh, well, you have not 
because you ask not. So if we want to be close, and it's not that we won't ever go through dry seasons. Don't get me wrong. But if we want to be closer to the Lord, what did he say? Draw nigh to me, and I will draw nigh to you. So there's that joy of close fellowship. He said in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him. That is, have close fellowship with him and he with me. In other words, he says, if you'll pull on up a little closer, I will draw nigh to you. Pull up to the table with you. So it's the joy of close fellowship. Fourth benefit I would give you would be this. There's the promise of rest. That's a benefit of living close to the Lord is a promise of rest. And that benefit comes from one of my favorite verses in all the Bible, Matthew 11 and verse 28. Come unto me, draw a little closer, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You just pull up a little closer. Come unto me, and I'll give you rest. And what did he say right after that? He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. See, a yoke, a yoke is designed to share the load, to half the load. You have two animals that are yoked together. What are they doing? Two are better than one. When we yoke up with the Lord, he helps us bear our burdens. He helps us to carry the load. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. He's saying, let me come alongside you. You don't have to bear your burdens alone. You don't have to be burdened down. You can come to me. And then he says a wonderful line, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And you know, uh, you can think of it like this. God puts a little wind in your sails as you pull up a little closer. He puts a wind in your sails. Uh, Brother Carol Magruder of the great Magruder family, he had a wonderful quote. There was a video. I remember this video that I watched as a very young child. I'll tell you how young it was. I ate the case <laughs> or chewed it up or something. You, you can see it in our house. Part of the case is gone. That's how young I was. And uh, that song we recorded one time said, you got to have the want to. That was, on that, that was on that recording. But he made a quote, I believe it was on that video, and he basically said this. If you follow Jesus easy, it's hard. But if you follow Jesus hard, it's easy. <laughs> he puts a wind in your sails as you pull up a little closer. In other words, if you just try and barely serve the Lord. If you just try and barely be committed to him, you'll find it hard to keep it up. Amen. You'll find it hard to keep it up because the world's pull is still so strong. You can get sucked back in pretty easy. But if you pull up a little closer, if you follow him hard, if you let your soul pant like the deer, after the Lord God. If you get yourself so committed, you scare yourself. If you get yourself so committed to God, the world thinks you're crazy. He says, I'll give you rest. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll rest your soul. I'll rest your spirit. And his kind of rest brings a rest even to your physical body as well. Because, you know, you can get your mind so worked up that it'll run your body down. But if you get your mind and your heart and your soul in a place of peace with the Lord, it'll help your body. Isn't that something? He's a 360-degree Savior, isn't he? He takes care of the whole man. So it's the promise of rest. Number five, I would say this. It's the promise of fruitfulness. The promise of fruitfulness. That's a benefit of living close to the Lord. Spoken of in John chapter 15, Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you. In other words, let's have a close relationship. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me, Jesus says. He says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. 
He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Much fruit. And then we all know this line, my bet. For without me, ye can do nothing. Nothing. N-O-T-H-I-N-G, nothing. You say, I want my life to count for God. I want to produce fruit for the kingdom. Pull up a little closer. Just pull up a little closer. Abide in the vine. You say, I want to make a difference in this world. I want to make a difference for God in the time I have on this earth. He says, just pull up a little closer. Amen. Abide in me and I in you and you will bear much fruit. It's the promise of fruitfulness. Because you think about it. What does a limb from a tree do if it gets distant from the tree trunk? It dies. It dies because it has to be connected to the vine. It will not make it. It will not produce fruit apart from the tree because it's away from its source. The branch has been broken off from the vine. That's why we need to draw near. That's why we need to be in vibrant, healthy relationship with the Lord in his vineyard. Not withering away, not fruitless in our life. We want to bear fruit. We want our lives to count for something in the kingdom of God. Yes. So we must draw nigh. Pull up a little closer and he gives us the promise of fruitfulness. Bearing much fruit for his kingdom. And then one more benefit I would give you before we go to the application of how this happens. One more benefit would be a help for holiness. Living close to the Lord is a help for holiness. In other words, it helps me in my living for the Lord, my lifestyle with the Lord. Because you think about it. What have we just been saying? We've been saying when I'm living close to the Lord, I can understand the secrets of the kingdom he reveals to me. I can better hear his voice. There's the promise of the joy of close fellowship. There's the promise of rest, the promise of fruitfulness. What better setup can you have? To live life holy before the Lord. Yes. What better? You're hearing his voice. You're in close fellowship with him. And that's a help to our holy righteous living before him. Galatians 5 and 16 says it like this. This I say then. Walk in the spirit. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the spirit. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So walk in the spirit. Pull up a little closer. Let the Spirit have His way in your life. Let Him get all of you. Obey the initial promptings He sends your way. You're trying to walk in step with the Spirit of God. Let Him have all of you. And when you walk in the Spirit, He says, Ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And you know the reverse of that, when we find ourselves fulfilling the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the evil desires that come upon us, that are in our heart, that the world tries to ascend our way, then we must question, I must not be walking in the Spirit. I must not be letting Him lead me as I ought if I find myself begin to fulfill the lust of the flesh. So living close to the Lord is a help to holiness. Now I want to finish this morning by giving you just a few benefits, not, not benefits, but uh, keys rather, keys to how this happens. The benefits I've given you are not an exhaustive list. I mean, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. I mean, you can just name and name and name of things that are benefits of serving the Lord, being close to him. But for the rest of the, our time today, I want to give us five keys and just comment ever so briefly, five keys as briefly as I can, to drawing near to God. Five keys to drawing near to God, and we'll lift them right out of James 4. I wish I could talk about every detail in what we read there, uh, like maybe we would if we were doing a Bible study, but I'm just going to lift out some phrases. Here's the number one key. If we want to draw near to God, it'll take a life of God-centered prayer. A life of God-centered prayer. What did we talk about? Ye have not because ye ask not. Ye have not because ye ask not. And the reason I say God-centered prayer is because of what he said in verse 3. Notice what he said. He said, ye ask and receive not 
because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your uh, lust. In other words, we ask in a way, oftentimes, that doesn't please God because we're asking with the wrong motives. We're, we're asking amiss. We're asking that we may consume it upon our own lust. It's self-centered praying rather than God-centered praying. It takes a life of God-centered prayer. When we're self-centered in our prayer life rather than God-centered, we're not praying in a way that pleases God, and we'll begin to find ourselves not getting answers to our prayers and wondering why. He says, well, you're asking amiss because you're self-centered in your praying. You're trying to make it the way you want it to be rather than the way God wants it to be. We need a life of God-centered prayer. In other words, praying for God's will to be done in the situations we face. Praying for God's guidance to make decisions and decide what we must do in choices. Praying about the big things. Praying about the little things. Praying when we feel like it. Praying when we don't feel like it. Praying when it all makes sense to us. Praying even harder when it doesn't make sense. Uh, the Bible tells us we are to pray without ceasing. In other words, be in a continual attitude of prayer. A prayer life where you can just kind of jut in and out of praying. You can just cut in and out of your, your, you're just talking to him all the time. It's continually. And you begin to just find yourself praying. And you, sometimes you don't even realize what you're doing. Because you're just so used to it. It's a continual conversation with the Lord. <laughs> Chuck Swindoll has described this idea of praying without ceasing is the idea of a hacking cough. Praying with that kind of frequency. As much as if you had a hacking cough, how frequently you would cough. Pray like that. Okay? Pray like that. As many times as you would cough, pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray frequently. Have an attitude of prayer in your heart, a prayer on your lips. It's a life of God-centered prayer. You say, um, I just don't feel as close to God as I used to be. You have not because you ask not. Uh, one person said it pretty good. They said, we're as, basically, we're as close to God as we choose to be. We're as close to God as we choose to be. So if we're going to draw near to God, it'll take a life saturated in God-centered prayer. Number two comes from verse four, and it goes along with something I've just said. Uh, if we're going to draw near to God, we need a priority of holiness. A priority of holiness. And what did I just say? Living close to God is a help to holiness. He helps us get to the place he wants us to be. And it says right there in verse 4, the friendship of the world is enmity with God. In other words, when we get friendly with the world and its ways, we become at enmity with God. And that word enmity has to do with the word enemy, as it is mentioned there in the last part of verse 4. We make ourselves to be an enemy with God when we get friendly with the world and its ways that are contrary to the ways of God. Right. And you say, well, Nathan, you know, um, I know I don't live as far away from the world as I should. And, uh, you know, I know God's word says this is wrong. But, Nathan, I just still feel like I'm right with God. I, you know, I know the Bible says this is wrong. I know I'm not living for the Lord as much as I should. But I just still feel like I'm right with God. Well, here's the truth. That's kind of like saying, I love my wife, but I still kind of like the girlfriend I had before I married her. You go home, you try that, let me know how it works. It won't work. It won't turn out good. See, once you get married, you devote yourself to your spouse. What was one thing that was mentioned in those marriage vows? Three words. Forsaking all others. Forsaking all others. Only unto her. Only unto him. See, your spouse is jealous over you with a godly jealousy. Because they don't want you to be with anybody else other than them. Because they love you dearly. You're committed to one another. It's the same way with God. See, here's why I shouldn't flirt 
with the world. I'm already married. You didn't know that, did you? I'm not talking about that. I'm the bride of Christ. As a Christian, the Bible tells me I'm the bride of Christ. So I'm liable to commit spiritual fornication, spiritual adultery, if I'm flirting with the world. I don't need to be flirting with the world, getting friendly with the world's ways, because I'm already married. I'm the bride of Christ. And so if we want to draw near to God, we've got to have that priority of holiness, that priority to forsake all others, keeping myself only unto Him. You get it? Forsaking all others, keeping myself only unto Him, just as you do in your marriage vow. A priority of separate living, holiness. Number three, here's the next key, number three, very quickly, an attitude of humility. An attitude of humility. Notice what he said, a great verse in verse 6. But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. We've got to have that attitude of humility. One preacher basically described it like this. When we're walking in pride, it sets us in battle array against the Lord. God sets himself in battle array. What did he say? Uh, God resists the proud. So if we say, God, I want to draw near to you, but my, my heart is just filled with pride. Mm -mm. Pride is an affront to God. Pride is a dishonor to God in his ways. Pride breaks the heart of God. And he says, uh-uh, we're not drawing close when you're walking in pride. Because you see, pride focuses on self. Pride exalts ourselves. Pride says, look at me. Pride says, I want my way. I want what I want. But humility focuses on God. Focuses on Him, what He's done. It exalts God, lifts Him up. Humility doesn't say, look at me. It says, look at God and what He's done. And they even look at the accomplishments of others as we look to the lives of others. It's two totally different attitudes. We need that attitude of humility, humbling ourselves before God, saying, God, I, it's not about me. It's all about you. Uh, one of the greatest books ever written, I believe, was the book called The Purpose Driven Life. And one of the first statements in it is really just kind of pop your bubble. Uh, pop, you know, a lot of people's bubble. You know, maybe, maybe not you, but, you know, a lot of people's bubble. He says, it's not about you. That's the truth. Boy, this life is not about us. We, 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 we like to think it is sometimes. We like to think everybody ought to treat me good. Everybody ought to just cater to me. It's not about us. Amen. It's about the Lord. It's about what His will is in our life. It's about living in a way that pleases Him. Humility is an attitude that realizes I can't even walk without Him holding my hand. Amen. My righteousness is as filthy rags, and I want to live my life pleasing to the Lord, but I can't do it walking in pride because he resists me. He sets himself in battle array against me, so I must have that attitude of humility. Number four, it's a resolution of submission. We've talked about being resolved, and this comes from verse number seven. He says, submit yourselves therefore to God. It's a resol I'm resolved to be submitted to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Can I tell you, when you get serious about submitting yourself to God, the devil will get serious about getting in your way. That's the truth. Uh, that is the truth. If you get serious about submitting yourself to God, the devil will flat get serious about getting in your way. And uh, that's why we need both parts of that verse. We don't need just resist the devil and he'll flee. We also need submit yourself to God. We don't only need submit yourselves to God. We also need resist the devil and he will flee. Because if I'm going to seriously submit myself to God, there's going to be times I'm going to have to resist the devil in Jesus' name. That's right. uh, at times praying, sometimes very frequently, Lord, would you please get the devil away from me in Jesus' name? Yeah. Would you get him behind me in Jesus' name? You need both parts. And if you're going to resist the devil, though, in the reverse of that, if you're going to resist the devil, you've got to submit yourself to God. Because yes. the devil, 
You're no match for the devil. Oh, the devil, he can take you down in a minute if you think you're going to try to hit him with, you know, with your own strength. But he's no match for God. And when you submit yourself to God, you say, God, all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him. In his presence daily live. Yes. The devil has to flee. When you resist him submitting yourself to God in the name of Jesus, what did he say? And he will flee from you. What a wonderful promise of God's word. He has to get behind us in Jesus' name. We have a protector at our back when we are serving the Lord with all our heart. If we want to draw near to God, we need a resolution of submission to the Lord. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. And then lastly, number five. This is the number five key. If we want to draw near to God, we need a hunger for the Word. A hunger for the Word. And this comes from what it says in the last part of verse 8. It says, Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So if we're to have clean, single-minded, not double-minded, your double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. He's vacillating back and forth between the world and God. He's double-minded, single-minded. If we're going to have that kind of a mind, we need a healthy dose of God's Word every day. Psalm 119 in verse 9 has a wonderful verse. It says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. And I'll tell you, that's not only a good principle for young men. That's a good principle for young ladies, for older ladies, for older men, for middle-aged men, for middle-aged ladies, all in between. If we will take heed therefore, thereto according to the word of God, that's how we cleanse our way. And why is that? Well, the psalmist said that his word was a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our feet. He said, thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. And uh, you know, the electricity went out the other night in McEwen, did it not? And I had to get my phone out, turn the light on. I thought the bulb in my lamp had shot. Wasn't that, it was electricity was out. And so I got my phone, turned the light on, and what was I doing? It was a lamp to my feet, and it was a light to my path. In other words, it showed me what I needed to do, showed me where I needed to go. That's what God's Word does spiritually for us. It's a lamp to our feet. It's a light to our path. And then in the first part of James, in James chapter 1, it talks of the Word as being a mirror. A mirror. And when we look into the perfect law of liberty, we can see, just like we see in a mirror, the things that need to be done. The things that need to be done. So if we want to draw closer to God, we want to pull up a little closer to Him. We need a hunger for the Word of God. If you want to come play some, some music for us, that'd be great. Here's the interesting thing about the Word of God. The more you take it in, the more you want of it. Amen. Isn't that the truth? The more you take in God's Word, the more that you want of it. And uh, I got to thinking, I was reading yesterday morning, uh, finishing in you know, the, the Bible reading for the year in the last three chapters of Revelation. And uh, I was thinking about how that oftentimes when you read a book, that man, you just really enjoy that book. And you begin to get to the end of that book and you begin to think, you may be even thinking this, I don't know if I want this book to be over because I've enjoyed it so much. And you think about, you know, I finish it and then I don't, you know, I love the book, but I don't know if I want to read it again because I know everything that's going to happen. I mean, I've read the book now. And I got to thinking, you know, that feeling is not there in God's Word. Amen. You don't have that feeling. In fact, I'm excited to begin reading again through His Word. Because it's a living and active book. I just believe he's going to speak to me things I never noticed before. Even though I've read it many times before. I just believe he's going to speak to me. Things, uh, what does Jeremiah 33.3 3 say? Call unto me and I will answer thee 
and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not of. If you pull up a little closer, he says, I'll talk to you. And I will tell you those secrets of the kingdom. And I'll tell you, I'll kind of head for a close like this. If there's one thing I could encourage you to do in order to pull up a little closer to the Lord this year, it would be to have a daily time alone with the Lord. If there's one thing I could encourage you to do. Now, you, you can figure out when it works best for you, morning, midday, evening, sometime where you get alone, have a little talk with Jesus. Read the Word. Maybe read something devotionally. Spend some time in prayer with the Lord. And listen, if you haven't been used to doing that, a lot of you have, but if you've not been used to doing that, just start with 15 minutes. Just start with 15 minutes. And you will find, I can almost guarantee you, if you really got your heart in it, you'll find 15 minutes isn't long enough pretty quickly. You'll find, I've got to have more time. I, it's just flying by so quickly. Time flies when you're having fun. And you want to spend time with the Lord. It's like the hours can just pass. If you spend hours, minutes can pass. If you spend minutes... Here's the thing about serving the Lord, spending time with Him, following Him. Serving the Lord is downright addictive. Serving the Lord is absolutely addictive. Paul talked about one person, uh, or maybe a couple, whatever it was, and said they had addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. I'll tell you, serving the Lord is absolutely addictive. And there's no substance in this world you'd be better off to be addicted to than having a closer walk with the Lord. Isn't that the truth? Thank you, Lord. One person said it like this. He satisfies me, yet he makes me long for more. I love living in love with the Lord. So, this new year, 2023, pull up a little closer. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you.